Hello, viewers, and welcome back to the next episode of Environmental History Worth Reading. I'm Sean Karaj, one of the editors here at niche-canada.org, and as I am each month, I am joined by Jessica. I'm Jessica DeWitt, and I am the social media editor for Niche. Do we have a list of picks for you this month? It's been an exciting month of articles, video, and audio about environmental history on the web. Jessica's been out there looking for it, and she's found five great picks uh, this month. And I just want to take a moment to highlight how valuable this series is, because if you really want to see uh, what the newest work is, what people are thinking about now, this monthly list of, of what's new in environmental history across the world uh, is, <laughs> is a great place to start. So let's start over here with the Standing Rock syllabus. Uh, this is a collection of readings as well as a backgrounder and a timeline to the ongoing conflict related to the Dakota Access Pipeline. Yes, I think this is one of the, the news stories that has been most relevant for many environmental historians this past month or so, and continues to be so. Um, and this is just a really wonderful resource, I think. Uh, it was collected by the NYC Stands for Standing Rock Committee, and it's aimed at democratizing uh, knowledge and resources uh, about the history and why uh, this has come to these protests, why this is happening. Um, and it goes back deep, uh, about 500 years. So mm -hmm. um, it really just treats history as being pivotal to understanding the current uh, situation. And I think it's a really wonderful example uh, for how historians and other scholars can uh, tackle contemporary issues and uh, make it possible for people to understand the, the historical uh, underpin and underpinnings. So, <laughs> yeah, and the, the expectation isn't necessarily that someone's going to take this and teach a course on the Standing yeah. Rock uh, conflict, mm -hmm. um, but that there are pieces like it's broken out into various topics: Indigenous mm -hmm. history, North America, United States Indian policy, sovereignty, and treaty making. Um, it's like a, a web-based version of a teach-in. Yes. Yes. So this mm -hmm. is an amazing resource. Great pick uh, this month. The next one is more of a visual story here over at Slate uh, with uh, yes. photographs from late 19th century lumber camps in Pennsylvania. This is this is right in your area. Yeah, I uh, actually was at the Pennsylvania Historical Association meeting last month where I talked to uh, several of the editors of this book. And I just think the images are pretty striking. Um, I do do Pennsylvania history that deals with this time period. And a lot of the images that I find are just, uh, you know, devoid landscapes uh, cut over without the people in them. And this is focusing on the laborers, the people that made their living uh, taking resources from the land. And um, I think it's an important part of history that's kind of overlooked sometimes and just really brilliant imagery. It's based on the photography of William T. Clark. Um, and I just uh, highly recommend checking out these photos and the, the book. The resolution on the images is incredible, too, because as mm -hmm. you can imagine, 19th century black and white photographs of yeah. these dense, partially cleared forests are so complex, but the richness of the image is incredible. You can sort of make out mm -hmm. every little twig and leaf yeah. uh, on each one. Now, your, your third pick this month is also a photographic-based one, and I just want to... <laughs> brace viewers for how disturbing these images are. Uh, why women pretended to be creepy rocks and trees in New York City parks during World War One? Jessica, explain. <laughs> I just really enjoyed this article when I stumbled across it. Um, so in 1918, uh, these women were dressing up in camouflage and heading to parks. And there's accounts of people tripping over them and them screaming. Um, it's just a really comical but really interesting part of history that I'd never heard of. And uh, these women were part of the Women's Reserve Camouflage Corps which was part of the National League for Women's Service. And it was mainly made up of female artists who were using parks as their laboratories to figure out how to create the best camouflage for the wartime. Um, and the photographs are also a really great collection and they were just recently unearthed. And I highly recommend looking at this piece of um, forgotten women's history, forgotten uh, military history, and also with deep environmental history ties. So it is bizarre. I mean, and there are like <laughs> Where's Waldo esque pictures here of women in these like 
baggy angular costume so it's kind of a scientific experiment but also like an art group that was putting mm -hmm. this together it's amazing <laughs> uh your fourth pick is a podcast uh, ben franklin's world a podcast about early american history episode 104 which focuses on the work of andrew lipman and his book the saltwater frontier Yes, so Liz Covart, who uh, hosts this podcast, uh, opens up uh, the po po podcast by saying that we often think of indigenous peoples as uh, either in the west or on the plains or in the forests of the east, but we rarely think about the way that they were involved in the coastal economies um, of <clears throat> the colonial America. And this really looks at the 17th century and the way that they were involved in fishing. And I think the most interesting part of this podcast for me was uh, Littman's discussion of their involvement in the American whaling industry, which isn't uh, often talked about. Uh, so it's just a um, part of history that I think uh, we aren't well versed in. And I highly recommend watching, I mean, listening <laughs> to this podcast. And this is a good pod podcast to watch, listen to every week. Uh, Covart does a really great job. So. Yeah, like an excellent for obviously <clears throat> scholars and, and, and folks in the in the general public interested in yeah. early American history. Okay, wrapping up now with uh, an individual researcher's blog, the erstwhile a history blog uh, by Sarah Porterfield, uh, a, a piece about her own experiences with place and research. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed this self-reflective piece. Uh, basically, Porterfield is talking about how this summer was the first time that she spent away from being outdoors. She usually is a, a river raft guide. And this summer, instead of doing that, she spent it in the archives reading about rivers. And I think this is an experience that many of us in environmental history and other fields have know well. I often think I, uh, for someone who thinks about the outdoors a whole lot, I spend too little time in it. Um, but she talks about how during the process she encountered two rivers, one composed of documents stored in archives and one constructed by my lived experience of place. And uh, she just goes through and uh, really thinks through this uh, really well and I found it very compelling and interesting and uh, I definitely related to it. So I think it's something that other historians would enjoy reading. And an ongoing trend that we've seen in the field over several years of individual researchers maintaining blogs, often mm -hmm. reflective blogs about the research process, and another great example of that, I think, here. Well, that's a list of five. Uh, viewers, you can find that over at niche-canada.org, which is probably where you're watching this video to begin with. Uh, <laughs> and you can find us again next month with another uh, set of picks from Jessica. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Sean.